Bloods took my podcast, man. The sight of it will live with you or die with you. But you will never forget the shriek of the mutilated. The abominable snowman, the Yeti, or is it? A scientific expedition that turns into a nightmare for all but a few with the surprise ending of the year. Sometimes it almost sounds like something human. Have you seen it? You don't really believe we're gonna find anything out there. Well, Dr. Prell thinks we might. Oh, Prell's got a thing about snowmen. The trouble is that people believe that garbage of his can get themselves in trouble. It's the damnedest thing, Ernst. If it isn't a Yeti, I can't imagine what it could be. I could see it as it was chewing the flesh of Tom's leg. Honey! Stop treating me like a child! Will you stop acting like one? Dr. Prell brought you on this mission for a reason! This is not for the weak. This is truly the shriek of the mutilated. Welcome to our podcast. The robots took my podcast. I am Jordan. And I'm Anthony. Anthony, what movie are we talking about today? We are talking about a film, Jordan, not a movie. Shriek of the Pardon Mutilated, me. 1974. The horror exploitation yeti movie masterpiece are you wearing a black turtleneck right now just asking <laughs> i think i'm overselling this a little bit yeah okay we and smoking a cigarette with sunglasses yeah, maybe i know we are okay. scraping the bottom of the barrel of sleaze this week boy are we oh, boy are we this is the butter of it man this is the grease of it the hot butter and <laughs> we don't need to spend much time talking about the actors because a lot of these have only me? one credit and it's this film as far as as far as their body of work. Oh, OK. Yeah. Yeah. That's a little hard to I don't know if there's any body of work with a lot of these guys yet, really, yeah. even today. So to provide a broad perspective here, there are several tiers yes. of film, as you well know, there's just your general movies there's also exploitation there's even low budget exploitation and then there's low budget sleaze this is micro budget i guess maybe if the director had made many many films before this i would say this is a first time effort yes yes i'm gonna preface it with it it almost looks like mgm used to have this old series of movies with judy garland and mickey rooney called andy hardy and everyone was the same, usually. It was always about, let's put on a show, kids. And it almost looks like there might have been an Andy Hardy approach behind this movie with a community theater involved kind of spirit. Maybe maybe this was a real waiting for Guffman kind of thing going on with this movie. I'm just guessing ahead of time. Anyway. That's a good guess. But it was actually made by a director, Michael Findlay. If an actual director? Friend. It was made in an actual director. Yeah. Google him. He and his wow. wife, Roberta, made a number of really cheap sexploitation movies in the 60s and 70s. Oh, did you say Mike Finley? Mike Finley. I have heard of Mike Finley. Yeah, I read, yeah. I read about him in a book about exploitation in 42nd Street. I wish I remember the name of the book right now. But yeah, you're right. Roberta. Yeah. yeah. And I think he died in 1983. Well, I'm going to get to that. I'm going to get to that in one second. All right, so, I digress. My bad. Yeah, so for, for a lot of people who know more exploitation cult film, you're probably aware of uh, several genres in the 60s and early 70s that were sexploitation, that, that exactly that 42nd Street grindhouse nastiness, these roughies for particular tastes. Probably yes. a lot of people don't want to watch today because there's a lot of violence against women and what have you. Violence, bondage and gore really campy gore was saturated some things blood. politically incorrect as well oh some my things, goodness yes yeah. a whole genre and it was uh from what i understand it was more 42nd street and the rest of the world saw a lot of these movies possibly maybe at a drive-in near them yeah and some of these Late movies at even at porn theaters a lot of the movies that the Finleys yeah. made were or yeah specific porn theaters as we found out as well that existed apparently in certain cities in the south oddly right i mean oh yeah you know. or just 
theaters that would show this kind of movie. But anyway, actually, they were divorced after a number of years. And Roberta actually yes, yes. went on to make hardcore porn films. Right. That's right. I forgot. I didn't realize this was them making it, honestly. Yeah. A lot of these films, and this was more of a gore entry, more of a horror entry mm -hmm. into their body of work. Yeah. Which was mostly exploitation sleaze of every kind. And the type of movie that I think something weird distributes now a lot. From what I understand, it was a business to them. And that was really all they, yeah. the only reason they went into this in the beginning, because they had a camera on hand and they thought, what's the quickest way, way to make a buck? Yeah. They were being realistic about it, basically. They just needed money. Yeah, they were quick to the genre and they made movies for a very long time, many of but them. But they were successful, apparently. And they yeah. were successful. And so Findlay, at the end of the 70s, was still making movies, but transitioning into another business venture he had, he was developing a portable 3D camera. Right? That's which right. He, okay. I thought I'd read this somewhere. Yeah, yeah. which he had yeah. used in a couple of projects, but was going to debut it at Cannes. That's right. Yeah. But unfortunately, before he was able to do that, tragedy struck. And he was on top with, with several other people getting on the helicopter on top of what is now the MetLife building back then, the old Pan Am building. Yeah. And the helicopter's landing gear failed and he was hacked to bits by the blade, unfortunately. So he died in this freak accident, oh, God, tragic accident. Bad. Oh, wow. Okay. Now I need to be careful what I say about this movie then, I guess. Yeah, I know. Before he could market this potentially revolutionary camera. I don't know much about the camera, but. Yeah. Yeah. What wow. a way to start a podcast. Let's begin on, on a light <laughs> note about dismemberment and death. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Anyway. Okay, Anthony. Well, yeah. Way to start the podcast, Anthony, man. So in interesting fact, rest in peace. Rest in peace. This Mike is Sunday. also kind of a movie that nestles into the 70s Bigfoot genre. That's right. And for those of you that don't realize that was a genre, it certainly was. There were a number of Bigfoot movies and, of course, documentaries in the 70s kicked off by The Legend of Boggy Creek a couple of years before this. Bigfoot movies were all the rage. And this plays into that. In this movie, they're looking for a Yeti Bigfoot. Same thing. And before we really dig into this, Jordan, I just want to say to everyone out there, if you have any intention of seeing this particular movie, we don't always say this, but sometimes, you know, we're going to spoil this and this may be a movie that you want to see before you listen to this podcast. Just a thought or not. True. <laughs> I don't know. True. Very true. Movie's not for yeah. all tastes. That is true as well. Yes. I will agree with that assessment. So without <laughs> giving too much away. Without giving too much away. Until later. Opening... Wait, how does this with... movie begin, Jordan? Do you even remember how? I do, um, because it, it, it stuck with me. It stayed with me. It didn't leave last night, even after I went to the bathroom this morning. Yeah, a beheading out of nowhere. Beheading very quick, very swift, which is it's the best way to start a movie, right? And a hillbilly laughing, I think. Well, it's very confusing because it comes without any setup. And, and it's it, a flashback, I guess, maybe. I guess it's a flashback. It's so quick and swift, that's why I say it's that. It's so yes. confusing and unrelated to what happens after it that yeah. It's, it's, yeah, exactly. There's decapitation and the head falls into a pool and then there's somebody with a mask on. It's really bizarre and it cuts right away yeah. from that. We get a yeah. second of that. And we get to the, uh, the title sequence, right? Yeah. Yeah, with the actual Yeti screaming annoyingly. Boy, does it have an annoying scream. It's like yeah. this laughing hyena sound or this llama sound. I don't know. It's just this weird. Uh, and then yeah. we cut to a college classroom and we're watching yes. a child's hand drawing of Bigfoot. Yeah. On the screen. <laughs> and Professor Prell is in front of his class, who is played by Jordan, the thespian Alan Brock. Oh. Yes. Alan Brock. What a thespian name, by the way. Tell us about, let's, let's go into some of the actors. We just, and movie. we meet all these smart ass looking um, white kids. Yeah. They all look about yeah. 30 in college. Smart ass college kids. Exactly. Uh, and there's about four of them we meet that'll become, I guess, kind of integral to the plot. Yeah. There's later on. There's Keith and his girlfriend, Keith. Karen. Yeah. And then Karen. there's Lynn. Not like the Karen people would think now with a TikTok video. No, it's not that kind of Karen. No, Although she no, might she, sound like one later on sometimes. She sounds like a little bit. Yeah. Lynn, who looks like Velma from Scooby-Doo. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. And then there's also Tom, who is Tom. our... Poor man's Dennis Wilson. 
I was thinking of poor man's Harold Ramis. Okay. <laughs> I was he's, being more generous. Wow. He, he's always making jokes. He's like Jim from Equinox. Yeah. The he's Equinox got the Beach episode. Boys hair. I mean, Keith kind of does too, but he's got more of the Beach Boys hair. Tom does. He's yeah. more of a smart ass. He's our movie's comic relief. I don't know. Yeah. And he's the kind of guy that you don't want to leave alone with your sister because he's kind of like always out to get some. Yeah, you know I, I mean? think the movie wants him to be the comic relief, even though we as the audience really don't want him as the comic relief. I think the movie wants it that way. And as the audience, we don't want Tom to be in the movie. Really? Uh, we don't. We don't <laughs> like him from the get go. I didn't like him from the get go. I'm like sorry. Him. I don't like any of these people, but the professor <laughs> and you yeah. will learn to love this guy's acting. He's professor great, yeah. Alan Brock is just hamming it up. Yeah, he's not reading a cue card at all, by the way. No, he's memorized his lines. He is oh, yeah. an auteur of the craft of acting, yeah. and he delivers his lines like a dinner theater actor. Yeah, Everything with that gravitas. Not even Shakespeare in the park here, no, folks. Dinner theater, maybe community theater. He just stepped off of the community theater version of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf playing George. <laughs> yeah. Yelling at Martha movie. with an alcohol. Yeah. <laughs> and so but yeah and he segued into a big boy movie i just predicted his career <laughs> <laughs> from the past <laughs> and his movie career began and ended apparently with this film unfortunately <laughs> the world was yeah. robbed of alan brock's acting talents anyway it's okay we have more of him in this movie it's okay anthony remember that yeah you know. always have this movie so anyway he's taking his class out to go yeti hunting at this place called boot island Boot Island. It's not an amusement park, folks. No, no, no. Nothing funny. Doesn't have roller coasters. Yeah, it's not like Adventure Island or Island of Adventure or anything like that. Or you know, no, nothing like that. Well, Tom is looking for some adventure. The first thing out of his mouth is like, "Hey, where's the action on Boot Island?" And we're like, "Oh, That's Tom." Right. I was gonna bring oh. that up too. <laughs> he literally says that, folks. Yeah, like there's a bar, and they're gonna find the Yeti in a bar. I don't, I don't know. Anyway, yeah. So the Yeti's uh, a good drinker. Yeah. It ain't easy being a Yeti. <laughs> yes, yeah, so they're all going on this expedition with their professor to find this Yeti. And then yeah. there's a party going on. And oh, yeah, this party. And oh, it's well, music. before they go to the party, Keith is like, I I'm supposed to go have dinner with the professor. I may not be able to make it. Oh, yeah. That gets weird, too, in my opinion. Yeah. And then Karen is like throwing a fit because he's not showing up to this party. Yeah. And so we go to the party. And Jordan, what is this party like? There's popcorn, hey, and a big popcorn machine, and, and there's a lot of punch, but then you see a lot of drinking going on, too. A lot of drinking games, looks like, and then the music sounds like the music from a Star Wars cantina sequence that got lost somewhere. Yeah, that song 70s. very famously is Popcorn by Hot Butter. Really? Oh, wow. That's the actual title. Popcorn is the song. Hot Butter is the band. It's an early synth song that will be catchy maybe the first time you hear it and annoying yeah. every other time that you hear it after that i oh, yeah you've I heard this song that. folks i think even crazy frog covered it in the 2000s or something it sounded vaguely oddly familiar yeah 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 at first i thought it was literally because i've been watching so much mandalorian and boba fett lately i literally thought stopped and went wait a minute did i hear that as a background theme on one of these cantina sequences on boba fett or mandalorian <laughs> It's the music that plays in hell, Jordan, is what it is. Anyway. Too, yeah, definitely. <laughs> and yeah. it's not the kind of music that I think that would be played at a 70s party. It's odd for a seven, even for a 70s party, it's odd. And yes. It's not it the kind is. of music you get up and dance to, although people are trying very hard. They are. That. And by the way, there is like hardly anybody of color at this party. I'm sorry I'm going to nitpick here, but yeah, it kind of bothers me. The only diversity it's in this film is the Yeti. That's all you get. <laughs> there are so many white people at this party. It, it's like blinding in a way. So we're at this swinging college party, and I realize there's a lot more floor sitting yeah. going on in the 70s. In college a lot parties. of floor there's sitting. There's not enough furniture at this party, clearly. They have all these people stuffed into this tiny living room. It looks like the size of a trailer park living room back then. Yeah, really tiny. The gang is all there. Scooby and the gang, once again, are all there. Tom, Keith, yeah. Yeah. Delma, Daphne. Oh, sorry. Oh, Keith is at a, uh, or I mean, Keith. Oh, is that's a, right. I forgot. Keith is with the professor at he's dinner with the, with professor. the professor. Yeah. Cause you, you know, you'd rather be at dinner with the professor than at a party where there's a lot of drinking going on. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of people your own age there. 
And so from the swinging party, they cut to the professor and Keith at this at this fancy restaurant, right? And Keith has just finished his salad. And he goes, wow, that was quite a salad. <laughs> it's a fancy restaurant, Jordan. It's nice. And it also, I might I say how big the bowl is that the salad came in. Good God, it's like, it's not just a side starter salad. It's like a big ass salad, you know? I don't, yeah. You'd think for a fancy restaurant too, they wouldn't even be giving you that big a salad even. It'd be French portion. Anyway. Yeah, well, the bowl had sideburns on it. That's what I noticed. Keith is a good guy, yeah. He is being sort of groomed by the professor. You can tell that he's one of his favorite students, right? Yeah, there's some weird grooming going on here. There's I some weird that word. something going on. Anyway, <laughs> I don't know what the, what, what the professor's intentions are, but... I thought about that after a while. I'm like, well, the professor seems nice, but... Wait a minute. Why is he buying him dinner and uh, yeah. take him to a fancy restaurant with something that he orders off the menu? Yeah. That's a little that's a little weird. Keith, if he has a van, don't get in. Oh, wait, the professor does have a van. Never mind. I think yeah. The mystery yeah, mobile. Does, actually. It's got <laughs> it's got big flowers on the side, but anyway. It does look like the mystery mobile, folks, right out of Scooby Doo. It does. I mean, this whole gang yeah. is like kind of like Equinox. They're like Scooby and the gang without the dog. Yeah, you almost wonder if the Finleys saw Scooby-Doo or something, or they were getting high on Saturday morning watching Scooby-Doo or something, and went, oh, there's our next movie right there. there. You movie. Know. Yeah, we yeah. need more blood and gore, right? We yeah. Need- <laughs> when you go to the blood and gore area, we've already done porn. We've been there, yeah. done that. Yeah. We need- let's do horror. We- let's, have- let's have a scene where Daphne's tied up. Anyway. Scooby with more blood. Yeah. And yeah. Th- we see him at this restaurant, and the professor's bragging about this specialty dish yeah yeah that's not on the menu it's it's only yeah. for like people in the know yeah that the chef cooks specially for him apparently and it's called gin sung i think it's called yeah. something like that <laughs> it sounds dirty it, it sounds like something for sure and it's a yeah. delicacy known around the world and so professor prell is kind of taking keith under his wing you know, it's like his favorite student. So he's sort of ingratiating him into this dish. Which is a little weird in my opinion. I don't know. Maybe I'm reading too much into it. But So anyways, <laughs> we go back to the swinging party, Jordan. We have this guy and his wife, Spencer St. Clair, show up at the party. And he turns out is a former professor who had a very shocking experience. Yeah. That has caused him some post-traumatic stress syndrome. So he's got anxiety. He is not enjoying this party. And he just orders his wife, his girlfriend, April. It's like, go get me a drink. Total asshole. Yeah, exactly. You don't really like him at all from the get-go. So you almost don't even care about what's going to happen with him later on, luckily. But yeah, he's got a bad comb over, a bad attitude. And yeah. then, of course, Velma, uh, I mean, Lynn goes up to him Velma. and says <laughs> yeah exactly pretty much hey we're going on this uh, this expedition to find the yeti with professor and he loses it he's just like oh yeah don't go there and then he stands up and gives this big monologue to the whole party total buzzkill yeah. weirding everybody yeah. out about how he went on this expedition with the professor a few years earlier and how three people died and how he survived and woke up in a hospital and, yeah. and he's been freaked out ever since and just a raging alcoholic, basically. The, the sad part, too, is he's the most animated actor right now in the whole movie. And you can't help but not watch him. But, of course, it's like a train wreck. Yeah, he's the only one trying to act in this movie. Everybody else is just talking. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the thing. He's literally doing all this and he's trying to act at the same time. <laughs> he's buzz killing. Saying all this dialogue, yeah. He's being a drag at a hip 70s party and everyone's <laughs> yeah. just like, oh my God, you know, we have to invite April on. Like, what's he doing here? Well, you know, we got to invite April and he comes along with her. And so we get yeah. that. Anyway, he goes home, Jordan, or they, or he and April go. Uh, and, and he's like yeah. way older than April. Like, uh, I guess he's a professor. Yeah, that's the odd part. That is the odd part too, in my opinion. Yeah. Another odd thing already in this movie as well. Yeah. Is that this professor's dating this woman so young in this college crowd and he's at this college party. He's like the oldest guy at this college party. And yeah. And weirding everybody out. I'm just saying everybody else at this party is clearly like around 30. Well, they, you know, <laughs> they look like 30 year olds playing college kids and he's clearly 50. <laughs> and so they go home, Jordan. And oh my God, what happens when they go home? Oh my God. We have one, we have two to three 
literally connect the dots. Oh shit. Moments in a row. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he's looking for something to drink. He's going all through the liquor cabinet. Well, the cabinets in the kitchen, what tiny, this is a tiny ass kitchen, by the way. Yeah. And he's, he can't find any uh, hard liquor anywhere. And finally, he finds one bottle. And as he's opening it, What's-Her-Face comes in and tries to stop him from drinking this bottle of hard liquor that he found. The only bottle he found. And he smashes it over her head. And then we cut to him later on no, we cut to in he, the tub. He grabs... Yeah, no, wait. Uh, he grabs the uh, bread knife. Yes, I'm sorry. And starts to slash her the fuck up with it. It is messed up. It is fucked up. Yeah, um, he, I don't know any other way to describe it. He slits yeah. her throat. We're 15 minutes into the movie. This has nothing to do with the rest of the movie, by the way. Yeah, no Yeti. No Yeti in this scene. No Yeti. No. Yeti's not killing no anybody. No white Yeti. No. <laughs> so, yeah, it's horrible. So he slits her throat. And then what does he do, Jordan? And then we cut to him in the bathtub later on, fully clothed with water still running. And it's even halfway a bubble bath. But, of course, it's tainted red. It's after the kill. And he's sipping a beer in the process i mean it looks like a bad reenactment from an unsolved mysteries <laughs> yeah. almost but and no folks it's not uh, it's happening right in front of you he's wearing his clothes just sitting in the bath yeah no tie at this point <laughs> yeah he was wearing a suit he's losing um, up. yeah yeah and and then suddenly uh what's her face is still alive we see in the next shot and she is pushing a uh, slowly creepily pushing a toaster across the floor and you get where i'm going here folks she somehow has the energy to muster the toaster into the bathtub yeah. with him and plug it in. Yeah. First she plugs <laughs> it in. She's about to die. You know, her final yes. breath, she plugs it in and then, yeah. Yeah. And then he gets electrocuted in the tub and it's hilarious because he's literally going Aah! and jolting and all that. And, and like you said, he's the best actor so far and he may be the best actor in the film. I don't know. He's at least trying. It's he's a race giving it to the all. bottom. But yes. yeah, he's he actually slides down into the water. He's got bath bubbles in his mouth, and I will give him props for that. I, even if he did just step out of the community theater local version of Our Town, <laughs> yes, he's trying his hardest, Anthony. <laughs> That's all I'll say. So then we cut to the mystery mobile as aforementioned, the professor's van with flowers on it. Why a professor has a van with flowers on it, I don't know. But they it's are those going. Those 70s kind of clover licking the flowers, folks. Yeah. yeah. And so we're off to see the Yeti. We're going to this place called Boot Island. Yeah. And we're going to go catch us some Yeti. Yeah. And so literally, they're about to leave, and I guess some sort of gas station attendant or mechanic or somebody. That, now, Jordan, this guy is not an actor right clearly not and you no. can tell because he just spouts literally a bunch of nonsense which i don't understand i listened to this a couple times and i just do not understand what he was talking about from what i know a director in that situation what they do with an actor like that is they feed the lines to them one sentence by sentence off camera and have them repeat what they say probably would happen here too yeah you get mixed results with that bag of course <laughs> well here are some mixed results here because i could tell some kind of warning and he said, take care of those girls. And I, I yeah. you know, I don't, there's some. It's this, like the director says, okay, say, beware the Yeti. Beware the Yeti. It's coming to get you. It's coming to get you. Something like that. You know, if you were directing. I wish he was talking. You know? I mean, he doesn't even mention the Yeti. But anyway, oh, not right. important. Yeah, just, yeah. Not important. So they get to the private island, Boot Island, and they meet who lives there, Dr. Carl Warner in this house. And he welcomes yeah. them into his house. He's an associate of the professor. And Jordan, yeah. I got to say, this guy could only exist in the 70s because he is rocking a mustache and a ponytail. He's this thespian. Oh, oh, that guy. Yeah, that guy. And he's wearing riding crops with all that, folks. The kind of thing you normally wear when you go ride a horse. I didn't see any horses in this film, but you never know when you're no. just going to have to ride a horse, Jordan. You just never know. Yeah. And already in this shot, you get two thespians in the same scene, literally, with these two guys, the professor oh, and Werner. It is a battle of dinner theater acting. It is wonderful. <laughs> and community theater. <laughs> and community theater. <laughs> just to throw that in the mix. <laughs> it is like that. It's just like, you're right. It, it's everything is just so overly emoted. Like, welcome to my house. You know, it's like, whoa. It, it's yeah. beautiful. I love it. I love it. This is this movie's Skull Island, you know, if this was King Kong. Yeah. Boot Island. 
you know, that's good analysis. I guess that's kind of what they're doing. Yeah, Boot Island, yeah. Skull Island, yeah. But it all goes back to King Kong for screenwriting 101. Yes, folks. Yeah. So Karen is upset because Keith missed that awesome party that Spencer went on and, and ruined. But anyways, yeah. she and Tom and Thelma don't believe really Thelma. in the <laughs> Yeah. Lacey. <laughs> I mean, it's okay. It's fine. No, Might okay. as well be. I just want to call her Velma. I don't. I don't know why. It's Lynn. Lynn. Yeah. Well. Okay, Lynn. That's it. Keith is all about the Yeti. Of course, the professor is. But Tom, Lynn, and Karen are not about this. And Karen is just jumping on Keith for the the party, and that's that's her biggest concern. Not the Yeti. Yeah. Party. Everyone needs. She to still be- has not gotten over that party and how he wouldn't show up with her. How he decided to have dinner with the professor instead, and you know. Oh, she's got a good point there. You she's know? jealous of the professor. The professor is kind of moving in on her turf, I think. Is. He really clearly is. He's like cock blocking her <laughs> or something. <laughs> so pardon my French, folks, but yeah. So, anyways, yeah. And I will say this in this house, we see Jordan how ugly the 70s was. There's a oh, lot of how flower can you prints say that? and harvest. How can gold. you say that? Because Tom sweater, Jordan. Tom's freaking sweater, man. They're earth tones. It's green and brown together. I mean, come on. In the 70s, you could get away with wearing red and green together. What a come on. I mean, it, or having purple and green together, even. I mean, I mean, what what Jordan, more do you want? Everybody, and not to be offensive, but everybody in the 70s dressed like they were colorblind. So no offense to colorblind people. The struggle well, they, is real. They and were. Everyone had they, that struggle in the seventies. They were all colorblind from the red M and M's, but that's yeah. another story. <laughs> it's those M&Ms. That was a side effect of the cancer from the red M and M's, I think, maybe, but I don't know that for a fact. But or it yeah. was all the Aquanet. I don't know. Everyone was inhaling. Anyway, they were maybe colorblind. I don't know why earth tones were so big in the seventies. Brown, yellow, green, constantly red. It's all fall tones. Yeah. So then, of course. Tom is sitting here cutting jokes and he's the life of the party, everybody. He's playing the piano and he's playing this funny little ditty about the Yeti. Here comes the Yeti or whatever. He's a triple threat, Jordan. He can sing, he can tell jokes, and he can do wonderful impressions. He does a sweet W.C. Fields impression. Thank God. Yeah. People don't do impressions like that nowadays. Tom is a dick. Tom is an asshole. By the way, yeah. I just don't, it's very rare that I just don't like a character in the movie so much. Like if, if Tom showed up at a party, I'd be like, oh, Tom's here. I got to go guys. This is fine. He's going to get, <laughs> he's going to go sit at the piano and sing his Yeti songs. I'm out of here. Yeah. It's nothing against the actor playing him. We're just talking about the character folks, by the way. <laughs> anyway, I don't know why he rubbed me the wrong way, but he rubbed me the wrong way too. I don't know why he's just an actor in the movie, of course. But yeah, for some reason you just watch his character and you're like, I don't like that guy. God, fuck that guy. Actually, when he was singing, I thought there might have been a lost musical of Shriek of the Mutilated that this must have been left over from this song. <laughs> and I might be wrong. And That was just my intuition talking. I don't know this for a fact. But it, it started to make me wonder about how Shriek of the Mutilated, the musical, would have looked all of a sudden. The theme you song know, from. With all these same people. Yeah. And I'm yeah, the Yeti, the Yeti, all that. Yeah. Yeah. I can just picture it. Dim sum. It's a, you know. <laughs> We're going to Boot Island. It's where it all happens. Yeah. Dim sum, dim sum, specialty dish. It's not on the menu. <laughs> Anyways, Karen is a snooping around. She's yeah. not, not sure about all this Yeti stuff, and she's scared by who does she meet, Jordan? Oh, um, uh, Crow. What's his name again? Dang, Laughing I'm sorry. Crow. <laughs> <laughs> laughing laughing crow. crow laughing crow yeah who was a mute uh, native american descent i guess even though they call him an indian in the movie yeah. sorry bro. i didn't make the movie and it's funny because professor werner is like oh you've met my indian wow yeah wow. like what a slam like he's his you know what like he's his his house guy you yeah. know or something and, and of course Laughing Crow does everything. He, he's the creepy guy that chopped the wood in this movie. Uh, as we later see, that's a cliche in horror movies later on, right down to Friday the 13th. The creepy guy that's on the property chopping wood constantly. I don't know why that's such a thing. And he also cooks and cleans. He does everything around the house. He's literally the fucking butler. Yeah. And yet the professor still has the gall to call him his Indian. Yeah. 
And so Karen is scared of this guy because he's mute and he's, he looks, I mean, he doesn't look Native American to me. I mean, he is wearing a headband and a feather, I think, or at least a he headband. always has this creepy shocked look on his face, I guess, that, that yeah. maybe creeps people out constantly. Dark eye makeup and he's this hairy, yeah. he looks at me like this big hairy Italian guy with no shirt on. But anyways, yeah. she's scared by his that. His mouth she- always looks like it should be saying, ah! <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's always open. And so she runs into Keith and she's like, oh my God, I'm so scared. And then Laughing Crow comes in. He's like, oh, you must be Laughing Crow. You know, so anyway, yeah, he's not Keith scared. Keith knows who he is. I guess Keith's met him already. Yeah, Keith's yeah. not scared. Fucking Keith, God damn it. He's the next dick in this movie, next to Tom. Yeah, he becomes more dickish. So anyway, they all eat dinner. Laughing Crow makes dinner. And it's, of yeah. course, Jin Sung. And yeah, it's, it's gotta be. Werner is like... Well, I noticed none of you touched your meal. Well, it's, you know, an Indian dish and it's not for all tastes. And then Professor Prell is like, mm, 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 good. This is, this, yeah. I love it. And Keith loves it too. Keith has had this like, oh, okay. I don't mean to interrupt, but when he said Indian, I was actually thinking like India, Indian, <laughs> like yeah. he made it really spicy and curry and yeah. I was confused as well because my mind didn't go, uh, yeah. The language and time period differences, I guess. Yeah, you know. And it sounds sort of Asian to begin with. It does, yeah. I mean, yeah, you do kind of wonder what the ginseng is made of. I mean, is it made of Yeti? Is it bear meat? Is it... You might not know, Jordan. I don't know. Mystery. Yeah. It, I mean, I assumed it was maybe Yeti they were eating, of course. That's what it was. Yeah. So anyway, Werner's telling the crew about the sounds that he's heard. He's like, yeah, I've heard the Yeti. And it's yeah. like, how do you know it's a Yeti? It's like, well, it's too high pitched for a grizzly bear and too raucous for a moose. And it's not exactly a banshee either. <laughs> no, folks. It's not a goblin. It's not a <laughs> wounded rabbit. It's not a half a lump. The way the guy says the dialogue in this scene, too. I'm sorry. It's just, it's, it's the actors in this movie. Yeah. I don't want me to be so cruel about them, but geez, man, they're just, I'm sorry. They, Amateurs 101. It's just like everything yeah. you should not do as an actor in a movie. In it. Too raucous for a moose is like a high school band name. I don't know. Anyway, we see <laughs> we see the Yeti in flashback in a bad suit as he's telling the story. So it's our first big glimpse of the Yeti, everybody, except for the opening sequence, which just totally showed us the Yeti. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> forgot i don't know if we mentioned earlier with the ptsd scenes and the other professor at the party but yeah every time they're talking about the yeti and the flashback scenes it's always done in this white out kind of because it's so overly whited out yeah. the whole scene with this weird odd black and white yeah super contrasty for sure very contrasty very high high contrast yeah, so Professor Prell pulls out a map and is like, oh, we're going to go get the Yeti here, here, and here. And then Tom doesn't believe all these Yeti stories. So later he tells yeah. Keith about the story, you know, from the party where Spencer's like, oh, and all these people died. And, and then Keith is like, nah, whatever, pish posh. Yeah. Whatever. I will note when they're looking at the map, this is one of the things that makes this movie look so amateurish, the lighting. I never noticed lighting in a movie. But here's some sort of floor lamps or flood lamps that are just pointed at body <laughs> level at the castle. Yeah. And you see their shadows on the wall. It's just really obvious. It's like they took the side table lamp and just aimed it right in the direction of the actors. That's probably what it's they like did. like it was overly bright. Yeah, because it's, <laughs> it's just filmed in a house, and they're like, well, you know, what do we got anyway? Oh, we didn't buy any lights. Oh, did you buy any photo floods? Uh, No. Get as many lamps as you can and put them in this room. <laughs> but I will note there must be a second story to this house because there is a almost a too far shot from the top of like a stairwell or something where they're shooting from above. Yeah. It looks like a home movie, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, Lynn has a crush on Tom. Yes. And Tom is like a total dick to her, Jordan. Like, what does he do? She offers him coffee and what is, he has the gall to fucking just take a sip and toss it and go, that's crap. Ooh, tastes like, like crap. Like what a dick. And I know Lynn is thirsty as hell. Lynn is, is hunting for a man. Yeah. Any, any I mean, man. Tom. Honestly, Tom looks like he stepped out of a coffee commercial in the 70s. You know why? Because I, I, I'm a big, I love, I like to watch old commercials from, you know, 70s, 60s and 50s because they're so different. And the guy in a coffee commercial was always the biggest dick ever. 
the husband, the boyfriend. That's what Tom reminds me of, the 70s coffee commercial yeah. guy. It's always uh, like spouse or whatever. Your coffee's terrible. Let's get divorced. Oh no, what am I going to do? Yeah. Have you tried Maxwell House or whatever? Yeah. <laughs> Marriage saved. At least your mother knows how to make coffee. Yeah. Let's have a little segment here in which we call dating advice for people in movies. Like, Lynn, girl, you are going after the wrong men. Lynn is like... Oh, Lynn, dating advice. Okay, yeah. She's hitting on like every guy in this movie. She's hitting on Tom, who's a dick. Even the yeah. Professor Werner. I mean, Laughing Crow, if he could speak. Girl, get some self-esteem, okay? She reminds me of like when I was single and I thought... Women only went for jerks at, you know, that was my mentality as a guy. Yeah. All the women always just, just went for the jerks. And Lynn, I'm sorry, fits this description to a T. She goes for the jerk. She wants the guy who doesn't want her, something yeah. like that. Yeah. And now Karen Girl, while we're talking about things, that Keith, I don't know, man, he's, he's, he's no yeah. good for you. Keith is not much better than Tom, I am afraid. I mean, he's only slightly nicer, but not so much. He's got a better haircut, but girl, you can do better. That's all I'm saying. So dating advice. Girls, both of you can do better. I'm sorry. Whoever wrote Lynn was just like, come on, geez. Yeah, they didn't like her much. Yeah, so, and she also sleeps with her glasses on. I don't know. Yeah, I don't wear glasses. Of, I, I'm, so. I don't think people, glasses do that. I think that's uncomfortable. I, I mean, think about falling asleep with sunglasses on. Yeah. And she wears giant giant glasses like these octagonal rimmed giant the 70s equivalent of chic uh, 70s coke bottle glasses yeah so then they're sleeping and karen thinks that she hears this noise and th she thinks it's lynn snoring and it's not it's maybe the yeti jordan i don't know maybe. scary maybe. <laughs> so anyway the, the whole gang goes out the next day uh to look for the yeti and then Tom is like, this is lame. I'm going to go off and go shoot a deer because that Jin Soong sucks. And he was even a dick. At He's like, I do your stomach pump like ass. Yes. Yeah. I mean, ass. I'm not knocking anybody who's had venison or deer meat knows it's really good. But I mean, come on. That's just rude, man. You're at a party. You know, everybody else is going to go cook something else. And you're like, yeah, I'm going to go do this. Yeah. He's going to go hunt a deer. I don't believe that Tom can go hunt anyway. But yeah, that's another. But yeah. What a douchebag. Tom, you're a dick. Like, I, I think venison's okay, but venison is seldom an upgrade. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> like, what? That's true. <laughs> Whatever's in Jin Sung. Yeah. Anyway, so then he's searching around this abandoned building. And Jordan, what happens? Um, Tom runs into the Yeti. Well, I mean, one could say he runs into the Yeti. One could also probably say that he's attacked and killed by the Yeti. Okay, to put it lightly, yeah. <laughs> He runs into we could say he loses his life to the Yeti. And he's... Okay, yeah. He gets killed. I'm sorry. I okay. don't feel much sympathy for Tom. I'm sorry. I don't either. I was kind of cheering for the Yeti, sadly. I was like, God. <laughs> this is one time where I was for the beast killing the character. Oh. <laughs> Maybe the Yeti's not that bad. After it's all. hard to like a lot of these people already as it is in this movie. <laughs> they seem kind of dispensable in a way. <laughs> And the Yeti's a bad suit, big shaggy white suit that they rented. Furry white suit. Yeah, it looks like it's sewed together from a furry white carpet from that time period. And he's wearing shoes. You can tell that the Yeti's wearing tennis shoes. Wearing sneakers, yeah. Like, clearly, wearing Adidas or Nikes or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> so Tom gets killed, and he doesn't return. Everyone's sitting back in the house, and, and poor Lynn is worried because her darling yeah. Tom is not here. Everybody's worried about Tom. Yeah. To, to toss her coffee Except for on us, the, the audience. <laughs> and she says the most ridiculous thing. She says, oh, I don't understand why Tom's lost because Tom is an experienced woodsman. Come on, dude. Yeah. And we buy that, too, just by looking at the way he reacts and everything, of course, and the way he looks. Because, yeah, you know, I mean, anybody that wears riding crops and carries a gun clearly knows how to hunt. It's like carrying the gun backward. He's a lanky dude with an ugly sweater. This guy yeah. would probably get lost in a, in a city park. I mean, he doesn't yeah. look like an experienced woodsman. Yeah. It's like saying <laughs> Egon from Ghostbusters, experienced woodsman. I mean, it's possible. You're just, being nice, even comparing him to that. Anyway, you know, yeah. yeah being no. generous. So they have this plan where they're just going to shoot guns all night and try to... Yeah alert tom to where the house is and so they stay up in ships it's ridiculous yeah 
No smoke signals, folks. They're just going to fire guns all night long. They're just going to sound like, you know, Texas during 4th of July. It's been 12 hours and Thomas just probably lost. That's all. He couldn't find the gravel trail they walked in on. It just got too dark for Tom. That's all. So anyway, the gang goes out to look for Tom and Lacey oversleeps. Yeah. Probably her glasses. So she comes in and we have this really weird scene between her and Werner. She's flirting yeah. with Werner and Werner's kind of about it, but I don't know. He looks a little more paternal in the scene, honestly, though. A little more like, I don't know, he kind of reminds me of like my mother comforting me. <laughs> oh, that's sweet, Jordan. I got creeper vibes off him, but I don't know. Anyway, so she asked him like, well, what happened with Laughing Crow? Why can't he talk? He's like, oh, he was attacked by the Yeti years ago and he survived. And ever since then, he can't speak. He's been speechless. (laughs) And so we go back to the gang out there looking for the Yeti. And then Prell sends Karen to go search this area. And she finds, what does she find, George? She finds Tom's gun. And and also she finds Tom's bloodied leg, uh, riding crop still intact. And he still looks like a dick. Even though we, it's just his leg, his bloodied leg, we now see it's, by itself. He finds his severed leg, and his severed leg is Yeti doing a, off, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. a bad W.C. Fields impression and drunkenly hitting on your girlfriend at a party. Yeah, his leg still hits on Karen, even, in this scene. <laughs> no, I just made that part up. Yeah. Tom's severed leg and riding crop, though. Yeah. And Lynn, Lynn brings the leg coffee, and it just like, Pah. anyway, so. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So Lynn's back at the house while this is happening and she goes for a walk and then goes into the greenhouse and we don't see what she sees, Jordan, but we hear this scream. Ah! I had to turn the volume down at that part. Yeah, so she freaks out and then she runs out of the greenhouse. We don't see what she saw, but she runs into the woods. And then what happens, Mm -hmm. Jordan? Um, And then she she gets caught in the rocks. There are some big rocks. Yeah. Am I correct? And then the Yeti comes... And uh, kills her, basically. Yeah, she runs 100 feet from the yard. Yeah. Somehow gets stuck in some rocks and somehow killed by the Yeti within view of the house. <laughs> it looks so stupid the way it plays out. Her foot just gets jammed. You almost expect her to fucking gnaw her way out at that point with her <laughs> mouth or something. <laughs> it's just a ridiculous way of getting stuck. Anyway, I don't mean to go on about that. What's more ridiculous is the terrible orchestral score at this point. That too. It sounds like public domain library music that's playing all at the wrong times. It doesn't sync up with what's happening. There's piccolos. I don't know. It's weird. If I was an actor, I'd kind of be insulted getting killed in a scene to this music. Come on. Come on. At least kill me to classical music. Come on. (laughs) Something. So the Professor Keith and Karen hear this scream and they're like, oh, my goodness. And one of the funniest things happens, Jordan, this is one of the things I love about this movie. So the professor hears Lynn, opens his mouth. We don't hear him yeah. say anything. But when he opens his mouth, we hear Karen say, it's Lynn. And it looks like the professor saying that with Karen's voice. And it's amazing. <laughs> for the technical part of movies for you folks out there, that is bad looping. Is one of the things <laughs> I love about this movie. Anyway, <laughs> so back in the house. Karen is freaking out because, you know, they found Tom's leg and she's overreacting. Yeah. She's blowing out the mic in the scene. <laughs> yeah. And boy, is she blowing out the mic big time? This is like the sound guy probably was just pulling his headphones off constantly, throwing him down, I imagine. <laughs> well, and the, and she's, she's getting up and she's not on her mark. The cameraman can't keep up with her because she's up and starts yeah. screaming. And the cameraman's like, whoops. And so, <laughs> yeah. The camera can't keep up with her either. It's like the director's just like not even saying cut yet, I guess. The director's like, we got this, man. Look at this. We're getting <laughs> such good stuff here. <laughs> this is Edwin style. It's like, that's plenty, you yeah. know, whatever. This is the first time, too, that we as the audience agree with anybody named Karen on anything. <laughs> <laughs> that we should get the fuck out of this place is what Karen is trying to say, bless her heart, at the same time. And she's just like, 
a couple other movies we talk about devil's advocate she's like mare and then vicky and equinox there's always that yeah. character it's like mm, something's not right here guys let's go home and everyone else is like nah let's stay and keep doing what we're doing what were you saying too about that thing about only they had decided in this movie the movie would have been different kind of thing oh man <laughs> there's two people dead not one They've been there less than a day or a day and two of their friends are dead out of four. I mean, at this point, you're like, huh? I mean, I wouldn't have waited for Lynn to die. It's all happened so quickly, but it's just like, well, you know. I think if the movie's only 90 some minutes to my memory. And if we said this is the way it should be, the movie would have ended at 70 minutes. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. But Karen wants to leave. She's screaming at everyone. Everyone's like, you're overreacting. And she really is acting like a 14-year-old girl throwing a tantrum. And there's even this one scene. I love it. She runs up the stairs and she just stops and turns at everyone and glares at them and then puffs and runs back up the stairs. And it's just awesome. She is like a She kind of looks like a poor woman's Catherine Ross. Yeah. Uh, Catherine Ross is a good actress. Don't get me wrong. I'm saying she looks like... The worst version of Catherine Ross. <laughs> and, and she does something throughout this movie is she adopts a more middle Atlantic, almost English acting accent. Yeah. At this point in the film, it's really strange. I wonder if the other community theater actors were coaching her or something. I don't know. Her I think that's just a product of being a community theater actor. You're just, your mode just went up when you go in those high dramatic situations. You have to start speaking with a, a, an English accent. You, know, you got to sound like you're Shakespearean I don't somehow. believe any of this. I think it's time to go home. I mean, it's like that. It's like, <laughs> come on. Where was this Karen at the beginning of the movie? Anyways. To be or not to be, Anthony? That is the question. <laughs> to stay or not to, to stay? To mortal coil. No, we to, must shake, find the to live no more, to sleep no more. I can't dream. Sorry. <laughs> Everybody in this movie wants to do Shakespeare in the I park. Know. That's their goal. Yeti in the park. And so... <laughs> Yeti in the park. Pro wants to continue finding this Yeti for sure. Yeah. He's like, I've got a plan. I've got an overly complicated scheme. Why don't we go to where Lynn was killed and set a trap? And then he tells a Werner, do you have any bear traps? And Werner's like, I have some wolf traps. Let me go down the basement. Anyway, he's like, and we'll use Tom's leg as bait. Tom's not using it anymore. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And even at that point, Jordan Keith is like, hold on a minute. Tom was my friend. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. That's not very kosher. Yeah. I don't know about that, guys. <laughs> Come on. Give Tom some dignity here with his leg. At least, like, donate his leg to a university. Bury his leg. Do whatever you do. I don't know. something. <laughs> so, Bury his leg properly. <laughs> we sit here and mourn for Tom's leg. <laughs> Tom's leg was a cynical leg. <laughs> <laughs> it's like told some terrible jokes. That leg did do a, a wonderful W.C. Fields impression, though. <laughs> It had a great song about the Yeti, too, that it did at the piano. <laughs> anyway. You know, that leg was the one stomping on the piano uh, foot part, you know. <laughs> so, Tom's leg, 1944 to ni- Anyway, so. Yeah, Tom's leg. Yeah, 1944 to 1974. Yeah. <laughs> So anyway, the professor is like, yeah, we, we've got to find this Yeti. And come on, Keith, we're very close. He's like, okay, I guess that's cool. Yeah. And Even I though Tom's like protests as well. <laughs> yeah, Tom's like, like, I don't know about this, guys. No, no, no hey. one's asking you, Tom's leg. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so... so. I couldn't help it. (laughs) No, it's good. The funniest part. And the end of the scene, Werner just runs in and he's like, I've got the traps. And the scene end. Yeah, exactly. Abruptly cut. It's hard to explain. It's amazing. I think a real change happened there. Yes. As they used to say in the old real changing days, current projectionists would use. Can't blame all the bad editing on real changes, Jordan. We've had about 20 real changes so far. There's a lot of weird jump cuts in this movie. You're right, though. It is oddly edited, honestly, from an editorial standpoint. So anyways, next day, the men folk are out in the woods setting a trap. Yeah. Using Tom's leg, and they literally pull a chunk of Tom's leg out of this bloody handkerchief. (laughs) It's really weird. (laughs) Yeah, so they're back at the house, and Karen is trying to convince Keith to go. She's like, let's get out of here. And Tom's like, what was up with that? Yeah. You know, he's your friend. And then they kiss out of nowhere. And then she's like, people died. And then Keith is not having this. He's like, well, you know, it's important to the professor, blah, blah, blah. We need to get this Yeti. Yeah. 
It's like Keith tried to give her the Superman 2 kiss of forgetfulness in that moment, but it didn't work. It just kind of phased her for a moment, but then went, wait a minute, we're still here. <laughs> and then so anyway, and then the professor comes in, Jordan. He's all yeah. scratched up and bloodied up. He's like, oh, I was so close. And we get a 10 minute monologue from this professor about his ordeal fighting yeah. the Yeti, how he was attacked by the Yeti and all this stuff. And he got away. It's, it's wonderful because. And for the actor in this moment, it's like, oh, he is, this is his moment and he is not going to waste it. He's going to give it his all as an actor. This is going to be the role he's going to get an Oscar for. You can tell he's trying in this moment. <laughs> Alan Brock, to his credit, is acting his heart out. I mean, Sir Alan Brock. <laughs> he's not Sir any good. Alan Jordan. Brock the third. He's not any good, but he's acting. Boy, he's doing it hard. <laughs> yes. Sir Alan Brock, fresh from Othello in the park. And so he was talking about the Yeti's heartbeat. You know how you hear yes. the Yeti's heartbeat. And throughout the film, we've heard the ba-doom, ba-doom, right. ba-doom of the Yeti's heartbeat. Right. Sir Alan Brock, fresh from Taming the Shrew in the park. This goes on. This goes on. Streetcar named Desire at the community theater. <laughs> Stella! Yeah. <laughs> anyway, he was so close, but now he's got this plan. He's like, I was so close. I've got a better plan this time, Jordan. I'm what are they going to do yeah. this time to catch the Yeti? What they're going to do this time is use uh, Velma as bait. Velma's corpse. Oh, I'm sorry. I got her name wrong. <laughs> They're going to use Lynn's body as bait. Lynn's dead body corpse as bait, Anthony. <laughs> OMG. The humanity. No, It just... wasn't Tom's leg. Now it's Lynn's body. They're going to use Lynn's dead body. We've graduated from, from legs to bodies. Pete. So going to use Lynn's body as bait for the trap. Great plan. And so after that, Karen's had enough. Yeah. So she goes out at night into the greenhouse, you know, still a little bit of light at dusk. And what does she see in the greenhouse, Jordan? She sees uh, this dead body of, uh, I am confused on the dead body. It's Tom's again. body. It's Tom's oh, body, right. Jordan. The rest of Tom's body. I'm sorry. The rest of, she sees the rest of Tom in the greenhouse. Yes. Huh. Something's going on here. So she faints. She freaks out and faints. And yeah. then we cut to I her inside. Scream really loud because I'm having to turn the sound down. I think at this point, right? This lady can scream. This lady can scream. Yeah. I'll tell you, this actress she can. Jeez, man! Oh my god! Even the sound guys, once again, must have just been like, She's ah, like get... throwing the headphones down. Yeah. In front of the reel to reel deck. <laughs> well, they didn't fix it, Jordan. I guess they couldn't fix it. Anyway. Giving you folks a visual, what it might have looked like back then. So we cut to her inside. She's laying on the couch, waking up out of. A... Yeah, she just she looks like a disenchanted teenager once again. Yeah, waking up in a daze, and Keith is like, "Oh, it was all a dream," and she's like, "It wasn't yeah. a dream. I saw I saw Tom's body." And so yeah. the professor and Werner are like. You didn't see Tom's body out there. Let's go check it. So they go out to the greenhouse. Oh, yeah. This is where it gets really weird. They pull back the sheet, and it's actually oh, Lynn's yeah. body. And Keith is like, this girl's crazy. She's seeing things. She's clearly not down with the professor. We're so close to the Yeti. And so Keith is not hearing what she has to say. Yeah. And then the professor and Werner are out the next day, and they're tying Lynn's dead body to a tree jordan to use his bait oh that's right they're tying velma's body to a tree oh <laughs> i said it and it's fucked up they're using a wire and they're just kind of really just rigging it up really quickly there you know on the fly and they put a nail on the back of the tree just to hold her body up it's fucked up and darcy uh, is just sitting there blank Darcy Brown, I mean... Oh, the actress playing her? I commend the actress playing her, yeah, because she's just literally just hanging there. She's doing the perfect job playing a dead body. I'll give her that, man. They use the actual actress in the scene. They didn't use a mannequin. No, <laughs> it's her tied to a tree, you know, looking dead. Looking yeah, bad. folks. <laughs> best performance in the film, Jordan. Best performance Probably in the, the film. Probably the best. Absolutely. We've seen Lynn more as a dead body than we've seen her talk in the rest of this film. <laughs> That's true. That's a fun fact of this movie. No. Sad fact as well. <laughs> and then, so the professor has this grand scheme. Uh, the Yeti's going to come, and we're going to shoot him with tranquilizers. We're going to blind yeah, him with these lights. Up. And... They're using her as fish bait, basically. She's the meat bait in Jaws. A year before Jaws. Is... Yeah, well, Tom's leg was a snack. The Yeti is still hungry, as the professor tells us. Yeah. 
And Lynn, of course, wants to go along with him because she's like, I don't trust any of you guys. And it's like, we're going to need some pictures. She's like, I'm taking the pictures. You know, I want some proof. Yeah. Something's going on here. Poor Lynn. R.I.P., man. She just, you know. Ugh. She's in that big porno film in the sky. Anyway, the Yeti runs in and just pushes Lynn aside. Yeah. Just runs through and scares everybody. And the Professor yeah. doesn't get a shot at him. And, and then we see Keith walking around after this. It's a great special effect, by the way, because you barely see the guy in the suit. Yeah, it happens very quickly at night. <laughs> it's, it's beautifully shot, Jordan. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> it happens so fast, you barely see the guy in the suit. You barely see the, the Nike stripe swoosh on his sneakers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Likely they're, they're white sneakers. He looks like a shag carpet. Yeah, that'd be a better film if a shag carpet came to life and killed people. That would, that would yeah. be, anyway, that's what it looks like. And so Keith is walking around after this, looking for the Yeti. And what does he find, Jordan? I for, Wait, I for, sorry, I forgot what he finds here in this No, moment. I have it written down or I would have forgotten too. He finds some speakers <laughs> that are playing the Yeti's heartbeat. That's right. And this is where we get to the shocking conclusion. Yes. Right here. We're building to a shocking conclusion, an even more shocking conclusion. Yeah. Something's going on here. You know, Karen was right. And then we see Laughing Crow. We cut to Laughing Crow at a record player inside the house playing the, the heartbeat track. And yeah, that's right. The heartbeat that we kept hearing in the Yeti sound. It somehow right? skips to carnival music. He's like, oh, crap. <laughs> yeah. It's the big Millie Vanilli lip sync <laughs> reveal. Kaleidoscope music. But Jordan, what kind is this sound effects record? What kind of record has both carnival music and a heartbeat on it? I, I don't know. Anyway. They must have bought this from a private library back then that was mail order business. I don't know. I, otherwise, I don't know. I don't, I don't know where <laughs> Laughing Crow gets his records. Anyway, so somebody comes and knocks Keith out. We don't see who it is, and he passes out on the ground. So we go from Keith being passed out to. Yes, yes. Cut to the oh. backyard. Somebody is severing a, a head off one of the many corpses. Pick one. Yes. Somebody is chopping a head off. Yeah. Okay. Then we see Laughing Crow in the kitchen making dinner, Jordan. In a pot, what the hell is the main course? It's something human, uh, if I remember. It's a human head. Oh my God, That's what right. is going on here, Jordan? A human face is in the pot. Yeah, human head and yes. So that means what they've been eating the whole time, that Jin Sung or whatever, has been human, possibly, Anthony. Dun, dun, dun. That's what saying I think, like Jordan. William Shatner. Something human, Anthony. Is that what you're saying? It is. Presumably at this point. Yeah, something's definitely going on here at this point. So we see the professor and Werner, they're having this discussion like, well, should we just kill Karen? But there's the whole code of the coven or whatever. We have to frighten yes. her to death. Wait a minute. These guys are up to something. And then what happens then? Keith comes in with a gun and he's like, oh, what's going right. on here, everybody? And then he starts shooting the gun they gave him to hunt the Yeti with. He starts shooting at them and then they're laughing like, ah, ha, ha, ha. those are just blanks. And then Laughing Crow knocks him out. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Okay. And then Jordan, the professor, is talking about having some guests over for dinner. Oh, that's right. Yeah, this is where it gets really fucking weird. You thought this movie was weird to begin with. It really just takes a turn here. Like, it's just like it takes a shotgun to itself at this point. Yeah. Big sawed off. <laughs> exactly. And Keith wakes up uh, from being knocked it out. It blows the, movie, the other movie out of the water. Yeah. Yeah, this, this is a whole different movie, guys, that you paid for. <laughs> and so Keith wakes up, and he runs outside, and the professor is moving the van because we have some guests coming to dinner, so he has to move the van. He hits the professor on the head, and he takes the van, just leaves Karen, by the way. Karen is, like, I guess upstairs laying down. Right. Just leaves Karen, like, what a douche. Yeah, that's one thing. Not much better of a guy than Tom. Yeah, or Tom's leg at this point. Tom's leg, I'm sorry, yeah. Tom's leg and his corpse in the greenhouse. We've yes. seen Tom's leg and Tom's face for dinner, I guess. Yeah. And so he hides the van because he sees these cars rolling up. This line of nice cars coming up the road. So once they pass, he escapes. He takes the van, he leaves. 
So he's going to get help, Jordan. Thank God. Thank God, man. Then we cut to Karen in the bed and she hears the noise and she looks out of the window and what does she see running to the window, Jordan? She sees a man. I hate to say it. Like I forgot what is it? uh, Is it laughing crow? No, she sees the Yeti. Oh, that's right. The Yeti. I'm sorry. Running toward her window. Yeah. Yeti breaks in her window. Yeah. Starts chasing her around the house. He's like, come back here. <laughs> yeah, it's like Benny Hill music plays, and they just like they have this chase scene around the house. Yeah. And at some point she runs into a bedroom and then she pulls back the covers and she sees Lynn's dead body. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Oh. And she runs into the bathroom, right? Did the Yeti feast on that body or no? Did even the Yeti turn down Lynn? <laughs> Not even the Yeti wanted wanted any part of Lynn. That's poor I'm Lynn. I'm sorry, that's a big stab at poor Lynn. <laughs> oh, so, oh boy. Anyway, <laughs> she runs into the bathroom. She's freaking out. And the shower is on. She's like, what's going on here? Like, this is all very surreal. And out of some little crawl space, Laughing Crow comes out. Yeah, yeah. And oh. then she dies. She dies of fright. Oh, yeah, because Laughing Crow, uh, something about Laughing Crow's stare, you know, that his agape stare, the hypnotic agape stare from Laughing Crow. Something about that. Yeah, well, he's got this knife and he scares her to death. And I, it was pretty scary, I guess. No, no, the whole movie is scary still. Don't get me wrong. This whole part of the movie kind of has slight Texas Chainsaw Massacre vibes to me. Not, not as that yeah. good, but... Yeah, it came out the same year, too, the original yeah. original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And so anyway, Laughing Crow takes her body downstairs. We see the Yeti in the living room, and he pulls its head off. It's a costume, pulls the head off, and it's Werner. It's been, yeah, Werner the whole time. That's when this is this really goes full Scooby-Doo. It's like, hey, and we as the audience kind of feel stupid for not realizing that, of course, there was a man in this costume the whole time. Because it's not a very convincing costume. But I like that, Jordan, because you're watching a movie in which you think you think it's a bad Yeti movie. Yeah. The production has a bad costume. And then you realize it is a bad costume, but the characters in the movie are employing this bad costume. It's, it's a twist. It's been a charade the whole time, though. This movie has been pulling a con on the whole audience. Here we thought right. we were on a Yeti expedition, after all. Man. Here we thought it was a whole movie, like Boggy Creek-type movie. No, we were wrong. We are stupid. I mean, it was so ridiculous to begin with, but you're like, well, this movie's just ridiculous about a bad Yeti hunt. But if there is any redeeming quality in this, in this movie, yeah. it's that. It's the fact that they... Maybe I took it personally because it made me feel stupid <laughs> well i walked in with such low expectations i just presumed that they would have a horrible yeti costume with sneakers on and not think that that was playing into the plot yeah and then the fact that everybody else believed it but then that's fucked up because they actually did kill those people so yeah and so keith meanwhile's the big scooby-doo reveal though big scooby-doo reveal <laughs> it was professor warner the whole time <laughs> And Professor Prell, because Professor Prell is like, well, you scared her on the stairs. Well, I scared her outside. And they're, you know, slapping each other on the back here. Because, you know, who scared her to death? It doesn't matter. You know, there's no... I would have got away with it, too, if it hadn't been for you meddling Keith. (laughs) There's no I in team, so... But yeah, yeah, you're right. Keith, meanwhile, has run away, and he brings the sheriff back. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And then we have our final scene, Jordan. Yeah. Oh, it gets really big. Wait, folks. It gets really shocking here. Big shocking reveal. So if that wasn't enough. How do I put this? I mean, how do I say it, Anthony? I don't even know. Where do they are? Should I say it now or what happens? Yeah. Emotion? What happens? They are cannibals, Anthony. They've been cannibals the whole time. Jordan, ah, not only <laughs> it's people the streak of the mutilated is people ah. jim sung is people jim sung is people anthony how many times do you want me to say it as charlton has it's made of people jim sung is people professor knows it's people he was in on it <coughs> professor prell knows it's people <laughs> everyone knows it's people oddly too i think this was the same year as soil and green 
What was it about cannibalism in the 70s, folks? I mean, God damn it. It's, it's everywhere. Even in Logan's Run, it was there. We talked about Logan's Run. Yeah. And so Professor Werner, they're not just cannibals, Jordan. They're yeah, an international true. society of Satanists, cannibals. Yeah. Like Professor Werner is joined in a coven at a table. He's like giving a blessing of the Lord bow breath or something. He's gathered people from all over the world, literally. Yeah, that's why. Yeah, it's a delicacy, basically. This is a delicacy for these rich people, I guess. Yeah, he's got know? people from India. He's got people from Africa. You almost wonder, though, yeah, if this movie in proper hands could have been a deeper kind of hard-hitting movie. It's an interesting freaking idea because yeah. you know what it's like? It reminds me of Equinox. Equinox, a movie. Listen to our other yeah, review yeah. of that in which you've got a bunch of stupid kids. and It's like where we said Evil Dead is basically a better, Evil Dead 1 and 2 especially, is a better version of Equinox. Well, we needed to see the Evil Dead to Shriek of the Mutilated. We need to see the better remake or yeah, we'll like what, take yeah. this idea and do something else with it. Like if what what if Paul Schrader wrote this movie or something like that? You know, Paul Schrader who wrote Taxi Driver you know, or, and Rolling Thunder and American Gigolo, yeah. you know, <laughs> would have been like if he wrote this movie or something like that. Or There's an idea in here because we get this it, big reveal, like, oh my God, this is an internet. They even call up, they even get, or a professor Prell gets on the, the ham radio yeah. and ta is talking to other people across the world. And they, they just keep showing this picture of this guy they're talking to. <laughs> anyway, man, uh, if you could only imagine this movie in better hands though, writing and directing wise, acting wise, all that, you oh, know, yeah. or if you have like Meryl street playing Karen, yeah. you know, even that kind of ball is going on with this movie. Don't even stop there. Anybody playing, Al Pacino is Tom. Young Al Pacino is Tom. Gene know? Hackman is <laughs> Professor Prell. Oh, wow. Well, yeah. And the list goes on. It put in capable hands. This could have been like a really interesting and good movie. Oliver Reed as Professor Prell. Oh, God. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> like, you can only imagine how this would have been better in better hands, though. Because, yeah, you do bring up a good point. So, yeah, there. this is, a, this is an international coven of devil worshiping satanists there's a whole history of french satanists from the 1700s who have Man. had the all yeah. these beliefs but then they realized now the, the only thing we really kept out of all that stuff all the the witchcraft was was the cannibalism yeah we picked our favorite part the cannibalism yeah. we kept the cannibalism we got rid of everything else and so once a year all across the world they all joined to have this ceremony yeah there's a bigger freaking story here, a way bigger yeah. story than. It sounds like something Alex Jones would talk about on his broadcast. Oh, yeah. Honestly, oh, I've know, seen some them. conspiracy they're, thing, you know. With, they're having these devil cults as a blessing to Lord Balbeth. They're cannibals. I'm telling you, they're cannibals. They pose it as they're all looking for a yeti, but it's, it's the way they suck you into everything. They're they pulling all the, the strings. Yeti as an idol. <laughs> hey. <laughs> I mean, if someone explained this, they make a sacrifice to the Yeti every year. <laughs> but the Yeti is a front itself, people. That's awesome. Because that's exactly what this movie is. It's a conspiracy theory come to life. It is. It is totally. I mean, well, you don't know that when you go into it. So I guess that's the weird part of it. It, yeah. it does a 180. It's an interesting movie. I'll give it that, even though I sound very cynical and insulting with this movie. But yeah, I will give it that. So all is not lost. Keith brings the sheriff in, right? He's like, yeah. ah, sheriff, here yeah, they are. Brett. And then what happens, Jordan? The sheriff, didn't he shoot Keith? You know, he didn't shoot Keith, but he turns on Keith and it's like. Yeah, he turns his gun on Keith. He acts like he's going to arrest them and then he turns the gun on Keith. It's kind of silly that he and does He's that, like, I'm yeah. one of them. I'm one of them. <laughs> it looks like they hired the local sheriff to star in it too. Yeah, a non-actor, they give him one line. And you're like, oh. The sheriff acts like blank yeah he's just kind of wooden and mannequin once again like a lot of the actors in this movie yeah and it, it's pure exploitation 70s 60s 70s nihilism oh and yeah. then keith yeah, is yeah, like what'd like... you do with karen <laughs> what did they do with karen <laughs> aren't they about to eat karen maybe they wheel karen in on the stretcher and she yeah. is the main course oh that's right good god man 
the humanity. <laughs> and then they explain the whole Yeti thing. It's like the Yeti is a costume and they can't kill people. They can't just murder people for their ritual and for the meat to yeah. taste good. They have to scare people to death. It's interesting. It has the same kind of shocking twist, like uh, another movie from the same era that came out four years earlier. Let's scare Jessica to death. Yeah, yeah. Where, where they were kind of, it was all a farce, you know, that led to something more shocking. That was a way better film, though. <laughs> I mean, true. It was a fantastic film, but it was a way better than this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Way better directing, way better acting, too. Yeah. But not as kitschy as this, not as no. weird. I think this movie uh, was the bottom of the bill on a drive in. You probably had Boggy Creek first because it's a PG movie more. <laughs> Boy, this is this is whiplash coming from Boggy Creek to this. Wow. <laughs> but yeah, be interesting to see. So anyway, Keith runs out. He's like, oh, my God, he's, he's Karen's body and he runs out and then they all rush him and stab him with forks. Yeah. Julius Caesar style. Yeah. At two Prell. So anyway. He wakes up and he's not dead. You think he's dead, but he wakes up and they're like, join us. Ah. Oh, that's right. And it's so got they got this Rosemary's baby quality going on at this point. I and guess, then it know. turns into freaking Rosemary's baby. We've had four movies in the past 20 minutes of this film. It just yeah. really changes and it keeps you guessing. And so they walk Keith up to Karen's body and they start like carving into it. And then what happens, Jordan? Um... Oh my God, I'm sorry if I keep blanking. No, it's okay, here, it's a little man. thing. And then he starts salivating. We see shellac or something coming out of his mouth. It's not real looking. Oh, that's right. But he starts kind of salivating. Suddenly, yeah. Yeah, and then Laughing Crow speaks, Jordan. And he says, oh, that's right. white meat or dark say? meat? And that's, oh, that's right. Oh my God. Ah! <laughs> and then that's when Keith starts salivating. So anyway, that's the end of the movie yet. It seems like it ended about three times before it did. Right, right. But anyway, but wow, that's a weird one. What a shocking movie. It began as a hunt for a Yeti, and it ended up as Keith's seduction into an international devil cult of Satanist cannibals. The yeah, whole time. a lot of movies rolled into one. A lot of twists and turns with this movie. <laughs> What would you rate this movie as it being a movie you, I remember you kind of introducing me to here. I will just say, like you mentioned earlier, this is a good idea, but the execution is terrible. Yeah. Yeah. I, that's my deal with it, especially is just the direction, I guess. You know. The direction is horrible because I mean, they just didn't care. You would think that Finlay directing so many movies would make a good one or, or want to make a good movie. Yeah but they just don't seem to care yeah it's amateurish in every way there's bad dubbing the acting is wonderfully atrocious it's very rushed yeah you know? it looks cheap it looks rushed the cinematography is the, the cameraman looks lost half the time yeah but despite all that it's so bad it's good this movie winks at the audience and is like i'm a bad movie but you didn't see this coming <laughs> yeah and i have to respect it on that level <laughs> that's true that's a good point a little i'm a bit. bad movie i know it so i'm gonna do a 180 on you yeah and, but a lot of the reasons you think this movie is bad that's not what's going on that's actually part of the plot and yeah that is why i think this is an interesting movie i mean you've seen this movie before right jordan yeah we watched it once before when okay. we were uh roommates did you remember all of this what was the second viewing like? a lot of it yeah i remember the community theater acting style of everybody and that stuck out to me i remember and, and i remember specifically professor Werner, the guy that plays him that that always stuck out to me and how thespian like he is in his acting and all that and how he's got the mustache the ponytail the riding crops and all that yeah. <laughs> every time he's got a gun yeah um, yeah, that all stuck out to me. And then the Yeti. I forgot the twist, though. I, I completely forgot the twist ending, though. So I was shocked when I was watching it again, going, oh, what the hell? I, I forgot about all that. Whoa. Oh, really? That's the whole point of the movie. Yeah, I did forget all that, actually. That's the funny part. Okay. So anyway, did you learn any lessons from this film? Or do you have any wisdom to impart on us? I, I learned that if your friend is lost and you're out in the middle of nowhere, you need to fire off your gun twice. Every hour, just to send them a message so they know, you know, where you are. They can find you. That's that's their way home. No, that's a bad idea. I, I learned not to do that, actually. I also learned that you shouldn't trust 
people wanting to meet you on an island somewhere to find a Yeti. Good God, who wants to go there? Yeah, and I learned what not to do on a movie. <laughs> and if you go on a school trip, then leave after the body count. Don't don't wait till the body count is like three. You know, one or two. Leave after two or one at least. Good it's God, it's time yeah. to go, everybody. I yeah. think. So, Jordan, what kind of rating would you give this fine film? Uh, it's hard to rate this movie. I almost want to come up with like a parallel rating system. I would give it a 10 for plot, but I would give it a two for script. <laughs> but then I need another parallel on top of that. A, a two in the camera department. Yeah. A, a three in the acting department. <laughs> and it has a hit theme song, which we'll hear in a minute. So... Yeah, and I guess that was a hit theme song from that time period. I, I forgot about that. I guess if you look at the history on that song. God, I don't know how to rate this. Overall, I guess. Oh. No pressure. Don't. It's a confusing and weird movie. Yeah. It's just not executed very well. In more capable hands, it would have been a very interesting film. Overall, it is an interesting mess, though, of a movie, once again. As I say a lot during this podcast. It's a train wreck of a movie. It's not boring, folks. I'm not going to say that. No, it, no, it, no, it's not boring. <laughs> it's definitely, once again, not a movie that you should watch sober. Definitely not. Please don't make yourself miserable. Good God. <laughs> yeah, do, Have a drink and a sedative of some sort something. or some weed or something. Please. Something. Do yourself Please don't a favor. Watch sober, folks. I, do, I, I implore you not to do that. So I give it. Out of 10, I'll, I'll go with 10. And yeah, it's a very hard movie to rate because for every normal metric, you know, you're reviewing against, it'd be a three or four. But because it's got that weird twist and it knows what kind of movie it is and it's like, gotcha. Me personally, I think it's about a seven. It's about a wow. seven out of 10. You're being generous. I mean, wow. because it's so bad, it's good. You can enjoy yeah. this movie on several levels. Okay, I guess based on your say, I'd give it a three out of a 10 based on the movie itself as far as filmmaking goes. Yeah. But I would give it a 10 as far as the plot goes. Once again, missed opportunity. Maybe it is time for Shriek of the Mutilated, the musical, Jordan. Yeah. I picture the musical, you know, Tom's leg song, Lynn's I Can't Find a Man song. Yeah. I mean, if you'd had like Robert Redford playing Keith and... Peter Fonda playing Tom. and then Oh, now you're just ridiculous. <laughs> Warren Oates playing Professor Werner. Good God. Can you imagine if this movie had been in better hands? Oh, and even if John Starr had directed... Yeah, I mean, it could be a Race of the Devil, of the Devil director, Do you think yeah. they would yeah. say yes to this? It's like, hey, there's a movie about Satanist cult of cannibals and they scare people to death with Bigfoot. No, nah, I'll pass on that. I mean, I'll they just didn't that, know them, you know, to approach them with this. But I'm sure if you'd been at the right party with this script... Yeah, they would have done this movie. They did Race for the Devil. <laughs> anyway, so great movie if you're into this sort of thing. Yeah, what's more to say? I think we've talked about it. You can get it. It's weird. It's a weird, weird yeah. movie. Anyway, thank you all for listening. Uh, yes, we really thank appreciate you. it. And next time, we'll be talking about some other movie, probably with not as much cannibalism and probably fewer bad Yeti costumes with sneakers. Possibly a different decade. Possibly. Possibly a different decade. Wherever this came from, it, it's truly a unique and memorable film, I'll say that. So, all right, Jordan. Yes. It came from 1974, Anthony. And, and keep an eye out for Shriek the Mutilated the Musical coming soon. Jordan, it's been great talking to you about movies. It's been great talking to you about Shriek of the Mutilated, and how dare you recommend this to me, Anthony? No, I'm just kidding. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know I, I, like I owe you one. I owe you one. <laughs> All right, everyone. All right. Thanks great talking again. To you, Anthony. Take care, Jordan, and, and everyone have a good night. Take care. The robots took my podcast. And now a word from our sponsor. Hi, I'm Charlton Heston. And as you all know, I like to hunt. Looking to get away? Looking for an adventure? For your next vacation, come to Boot Island, a private retreat in nature, all the way out in the woods. Stay in a double room in a luxurious two-story Victorian-style house. Sample some of the local cuisine, like ginseng, 
a unique native delicacy. And relax as you are waited on hand and foot by our concierge, Laughing Crow. And if it's entertainment you're looking for, go on one of our hunts to find the mysterious Yeti. We would love to have you for dinner at one of our world-famous banquets hosted by Dr. Eric Werner. Here at Boot Island, we promise a trip so memorable that you might just never leave. So come on, book your next vacation for Boot Island. <laughs> ah. All trailers, clips, music, or any other copyrighted material are used sparingly, edited from their original forms, and used for the purposes of criticism, discussion, commentary, and education about these fine films.